Professor Bassouni was there when the Israelis and the Egyptians signed peace. Professor Bassouni was there when Bosnia descended into chaos and needed the strong principled will of an academic and a thinker of his caliber. Professor Bassouni was there when we were in Afghanistan transgressing our own values and principles and he brought us back to our own self-reflection so we could pursue our own values with greater vigor and sincerity within the global context. This is the Professor Bassouni that I know. This is the Professor Bassouni who is a tribune of the people in this great city of Chicago as well as in the United States and the world over. So we are fortunate this evening that we're going to have a chance to listen to him talk. I hope we all learn a few things. I assure you that you will, and I look forward to the Q&A afterwards. Professor Bassini. What I, what I would like to do is to raise a few questions with you that I hope will be controversial. Um, and I, I know that, uh, uh, as usual, uh, my adopted son, Laith, will uh, rise to the occasion and never let me get away with anything I say without critique and, and sharp discussion, so I look forward to that as well. Uh, but <clears throat> I'm going to start with a very strange proposition, but it's a strange proposition that I will describe to you first as a personal experience that I had. Um, it was April 23rd, 1992. Um, I landed in Sarajevo Airport, coming from Zagreb, and um, there were some bombardments. Now, I don't know if I'm permitted to say this in the presence of women and in the Islamic College, but we were in a Russian plane, uh, and as we were coming down to land, uh, the Russian sergeant came out and gave us all two uh, bulletproof vests. And so I waved at him and I said, why two bulletproof vests? And he said, well, one you wear and the other one you sit on. Basically, he described that. And I was surprised, why do you sit on? He said, because as you come down close to the airport, the Serbs, they shoot at the plane. And so he rightfully understood that, you know, men are particularly concerned about being shot from that part, and so that they would all be sitting on these uh, vests in order to protect the jewels of the crown. Um, and um, so that's how I landed in, in Sarajevo. President, why don't you come and sit here? No, no. Come, father, father. And so, distinguished president of a college has to. <coughs> anyway, so we landed. It was in the middle of, of fighting. It was uh, about 8 o'clock at night. There was no electricity. And uh, after the um, fighting stopped, we were driven by cars to a UN compound where we were supposed to sleep. I had. Uh, we were a total of 11 people. Um, and, and the compound was basically a huge factory where they had cots one next to one another. And as we arrived there, there was no place. And it was full of soldiers and officers and staff people. So what are we going to do? And I said, well, where's the closest hotel? And they said, well, there's the Holiday Inn, um, which was not too far. So I said, well, let's go. So we went to the Holiday Inn, which was the closest thing. Well, the Holiday Inn was facing the, the, the top part of the mountains, which is in the direction 
of the capital uh, of the Republika Srpska, then called Pale. Um, and, and that's when most of the shelling and the artillery came on. Of course, I had no idea. So we went in there, and so here was the building, and there was no light, as I said. It was, by then, it was close to 10 o'clock, and the manager said, you know, um, you, you, your best bet is to sleep in the lobby. And, you know, the lobby had full of cots, and, and he said there's also some in the basement. And I said, well, I'd rather sleep in a bed. And he said, well, most of the rooms are destroyed. We have some rooms on the second floor and some. And then he mentioned in passing by, and we have some two rooms on the seventh floor. Now, I'm, you know, like my brother Talat, I like number sevens. And so I said, well, seventh floor, that sounds good. What room do you have there? So he said, we have room 725 and 727. So I immediately jumped on 727. I said, I'll take it. And he said, but you have to walk up seven floors. So I'll walk up seven floors. So anyway, I had a uh, military aide, a Dutch colonel. Um, so he walked up with me. He didn't want to sleep there. He thought it was more practical to sleep downstairs. And so we walked up, and there's, as I said, no water, no nothing. And the Holiday Inn hotels all over the world, I think, are designed by the same architect. You know, you get into a room, there are two beds, there are two windows, a wall in between. Um, the, the problem was that the, the glass on both walls was totally, on both windows was totally shattered, and they put in a sheet of plastic, and um, the beds were there, there was a mattress, but nothing else, and, and as I said, there was no running water. So with all my clothes and wrapped up in a blanket, as I did in, in those days, I, you know, slept on, on the mattress, and after I sort of uh, started to relax, I heard what people in the military call an artillery rumble or a barrage, which means that the artillery, which, as you know, artillery goes parabolic, it goes like this. So depending upon the elevation of the cannon, you know, it goes farther or shorter. Well, when you have multiple cannons lined up and you want them to cover a certain area, they all line up, um, they all have the same elevation, and then they change the degrees of elevation so that all of the shots fall like this and then like this and like this and, and that they do the most damage. Which also means that you hear it better. So you, you hear it as it approaches you, uh, as the distance shortens. And of course I'm you know, hearing it and paying close attention to it. And it, it's getting awfully close. And then at a certain point, Two bullets came through the plastic. They're called tracer bullets, and they come from heavy machine guns. And they're called tracers because they leave behind them uh, a sort of a trace of, of uh, um, you know, of, 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 of smoke or light or fire or whatever. But anyway, so these two tracer bullets came through the plastic, and you know, they made a little bit of noise and came, you know, about three, four feet above my head. Um, and right then is when I started hearing the artillery coming close. So, you know, I rolled over the bed on the side and I pulled the mattress on top of me and, you know, started doing my prayers. Um, and uh, anyway, at, at that moment, suddenly there's a huge explosion. Um, and, you know, it shakes the room and whatnot. So I, I pick myself up with the mattress on top of me and I sneak out of the room. And by then, my military aide is coming up from downstairs to find out what was happening. And uh, he has a, a flashlight and so he flashlights uh, on my face. And as I'm passing over room 725, that room is totally devastated. A, a bombshell had entered through the window into 725. It was totally in shambles. And I'm, you know, I'm looking at it like, oh my God. And the colonel takes my picture. So I have a picture in case somebody doubts the story. I'll be glad to send you the picture um, of, of my looking at this thing, you know, in total um, um, fright. Well, the next day, um, we're going up the mountains and 
in the direction of Pale, and I see the place where they had in place these four cannons that were shooting. Now, I used to travel most of the time without any protection, without any guards. The, the UN insisted and I would have one or two soldiers, maybe three, because I realized that, you know, my best protection was my vulnerability. Mm -hmm. um, there's no amount of soldiers that are going to really protect me. You know, what do I go around with, 100 soldiers? And they won't give me 100, so they'll give me 10, 15. It's a show of force that doesn't produce anything. So I had, I had two, two French uh, soldiers. Um, and, you know, in those difficult cases, and it's not that you're not afraid, or at least I'm, I'm not afraid, I am afraid. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, but, but you have to sort of cover your fear with, I want to say, a little bit of humor. And, you know, you sort of find a way to reach out in a humorous way. So I see one of the Serb gunners under the road, because they're just under the road. And I look at him and I said, I wave at him and I said, stop firing at Holiday Inn. The guy doesn't understand. My interpreter comes in the picture. Uh, and, and I said, I, we're staying there for four days. So please, four days, no shooting Holiday Inn. And the guys are looking at each other and after a while they start laughing. Um, and it sort of breaks the ice, and uh, one of them comes out and picks up four bullets and gives them to me, which I also have, but it's at the DePaul Law Library, I mean uh, uh, General Library in my collection of papers. Um, and we start talking. And all of this long story to come to the point where at a certain point, one of the 15 Serb soldiers and officers who was there decides to speak in English. And this was maybe about 20 minutes in the conversation. And he said, you know, there are Turks down there. It's all your fault. And you, so what do you mean? What are the Turks down there? Yeah, I didn't get the point. He said, they're Turks. And I said, Turk, what do you mean Turks? I said, they're Bosnians. No, 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 they're Turks. Again, I, and he said, Kosovo. Battle of Kosovo, 1389? Yes. The Battle of Kosovo, 1389, was as real, as present in these people's mind on that day in 1993, as if it was yesterday. It was a very strange phenomenon. I mean, for the first time, I physically felt it, you know. It was not an intellectual experience. It was an emotional experience where you, you, f you feel something real. And, and suddenly, you know, history had compressed itself. 1389 and 1993 were the same year. And... It didn't make sense to me until I felt it, because intellectually it couldn't make sense to me. And what, what I want to tell you is that what you see throughout the Arab world, and, and I want to very quickly add Arab-Muslim world, mm -hmm. is in a sense a way of juxtaposing, not 2011, but the 12th century CE, the 5th century of Islam, and 2011. And the controversial point I'm trying to make to you is this, is that in a certain way, the history of the Arab world, or the Arab peoples, as I would prefer to say it, while diverse, because certainly the people in Morocco are quite different from the people in Yemen, that the diversity notwithstanding had the common link 
of both Islamism or Islam and the Arabic culture that was linked to Islam. I say that because it is very difficult to disassociate Islam from the Arabic culture. The Quran is in Arabic. The Sunnah is related to us in Arabic. To know it, you must know Arabic. To interpret it, you must know Arabic. To interpret it, you must know Arab grammar. You must know the history of the Arabic language. To, to interpret even the Quran, the first rule of interpretation is asbab al nuzul or asbab al tanzil, the reasons why something came down. When did something come down? It has to be contextually understood. What happened on that day, on that occasion, that the Prophet came and said the following verse? It had to be something that dealt with the facts, the events of the times and the peoples. But who were the peoples, if not Arabs from the Southern Arabian Peninsula? What was the context, if not the society of the Arabs in that time? And what was the region, if not the Arab region? So suddenly you realize there is an inextricable link between the region geographically, historically, economically, socially, and culturally. And to some extent, this has to have an influence. The Arabs, for example, are Semites. The Turks are Aryans. The Persians are Aryans. But you look at the history of Islam and you suddenly see you're not only dealing with different ethnicities in a sense, people from different cultures in another sense. What is the common factor? And everybody says, well, it is Islam. But it's not only Islam, because it's Islam as people perceive and understand Islam to be. So now suddenly, there has to be a common factor that links the people together. And while everybody will tell you, well, the common factor is we all believe in one God and we all believe in Muhammad as the prophet and we all believe in the context of the Quran, there is more to that. And I, I want you to sort of transpose yourself to a rather... I want to say unique experience. Here you have this simple man, I want to say simple, Muhammad ibn Abdullah. Muhammad is, is in Mecca. He's talking about a single God, a concept which is not unknown to many Meccans. Um, you know, many Meccans have in the background of their mind the idea of still a sect that believed in a one God that remained from times before that. Um, many of them believed in a hierarchy of gods with a, a superior God sitting on top of the line. Um, but Muhammad is an orphan. And... <laughs> He is from the Quraysh tribe, but you look at the society that is there, you know, an orphan who loses first his mother and then his father and then, and then his grandfather and then he's brought up by his uncle. You know, that kid is not going to be the, the, the kid whose parents are going to give him for his birthday, you know, a famous uh, white camel uh, to, to, to race down the street. Uh, this, this is not a kid who has had a happy childhood. It's not somebody who had a difficult childhood and who necessarily had to be introspective, observant of others, uh, very cautious, very careful, making sure never to transcend his own limits 
um, making sure never to hurt other people's feelings, especially those who are more powerful. And, and he makes his career, his reputation, on being honest. And his honesty leads him to being accepted because of his honesty and his integrity. And so when the people of Medina got into a fight among themselves, they decide to choose him as the ruler of Medina. And he writes what I think is an absolutely extraordinary document that most of us in the world of Islam tend to forget. And it's called Sahifat al-Medina, uh, the, the, the Declaration of Medina, in which what he does is really establishes a federal system. In Sahifat al-Medina, he says, you know what, the two Jewish tribes here, you're going to run your affairs on the basis of your own religious beliefs and your own leaders are going to apply it. And there are other tribes, um, uh, you know, who are polygamous tribes that, you know, they're, they're going to, to, to be doing their, their, their own things. And only when it comes to the common interest will I decide. So you have the beginning of a federal system which respects diversity, underline diversity, because that is key. The key to the success of Islam's spread is its acceptance of diversity and its acceptance of anybody in the community of Muslims who accept to be a Muslim. It doesn't matter what the race is. It doesn't matter what the social standing is. And here again, think of the sensitivity of the prophet as a young orphan, you know, to the idea of, of inequality and social injustice. Anybody who comes in gets a chance. Everybody who comes in is equal. It doesn't make a difference. You can take a, a former slave who is black and Bilal becomes the first mu'addin Whose, whose voice resonates throughout the Muslim world and, and who still survives in history until now with some degree of, 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 of acceptance and admiration. Um, and that becomes the real message that precedes, call them the Muslim troops. And I use the word Muslim troops advisedly I mean, think for a minute. 642, Amr ibn al-As takes 2,000 men with him. And I, I suspect the part of the 2,000 included a large number of women who, who have not been identified because at that time, you know, women did travel with men, did fight with men, and did have an important role in that society. But he takes 2,000 of them and goes all the way from Mecca to Cairo, to Alexandria first and then to Cairo. To do what? To fight the Roman Byzantine Empire. There are 12 Roman legions there. You imagine the, what, I would, what I would think of, a sort of a ragtag army of 2,000 people who are coming from the Mecca and Medina and what we now see as the Yemen period uh, on camels traveling what is certainly a very long journey um, to get to Alexandria and face 12 Roman legions? How is it possible they defeated them? Well, they only defeated them because the local Egyptian population made of Copts was being discriminated against by the Roman Byzantines who would not allow the Copts to be Copts because they wanted them to be Byzantine of their own beliefs and, and, and who, who, who were uh, making their lives miserable. So the entire Coptic population rebelled and the Byzantines were defeated. They left the country. Egypt became part of the Muslim Empire and the Copts ruled themselves much as the Jewish tribes and other tribes ruled themselves in the days of Medina. And that was the secret of success. The local tribes, the local population 
Ahl al-Kitab, the Zimmis, and others, were, yes, they did pay a tax. Uh, yes, they did pay tribute. But they, they ruled themselves. And so what's the difference between the Muslim paying zakat and the Zimmi paying the jizya? You know, I mean, a rose by, by any other name is a rose. You know, a tax is a tax. You know, we pay this type of tax, they pay this type of tax. In exchange for that, the social contract, which is the basis of modern government, is, comes in. We, the Muslims in government, give you the protection, provide you with these services. The rest is up to you. We don't mix into your business. You run your own affairs. Suddenly, within a matter of 200 years, 200 years, almost in a jiffy, the Muslim world is, is expanding from, from Persia, literally to the doors of India, all the way to Andalusia. In 200 years, there would never have been enough Arabs in the southern Arabian Peninsula to have conquered that territory. There had to be something else. And I don't think it was the message of Islam. Because the message of Islam needs to be understood. It takes time to proselytize. It takes time to preach. It takes time to tell the story of Islam. It was more than that. It was the form of government, the system of government, the social system that, that, that came first. And people said, you know, we not only can live with these people, we can live in peace and in security. And that which was extraordinary is the moment you became a Muslim, think about it. You could travel anywhere you wanted to go. Is that right? You could set up business any, one, any place you wanted to go. That was before the European Union was established. You had freedom of movement, freedom of commerce, freedom of moving your assets. You had a system of, of capitalism this was, that was flowering. You had a sense of initiatives, and it didn't really make a difference. Whether you were originally a Persian that was working in Morocco or a Moroccan working in, in Spain or others. The fact that you were a Muslim eliminated any of these differences, but it also meant, when you think about it, equality of opportunity. Now think for a minute about the interesting analogy you have with what we today consider the American dream of a society of immigrants coming from different parts of the world. Nobody looks at their background, their color, their origin, their religion. They're given the same opportunity. Except that in the world of Islam, it worked a little better than it's working in the American society. Uh, but in the world of Islam, because of the preeminence of, of, of the religious factor, um, that was a dominant factor. Hmm? And that was particularly enshrined in, in a very famous verse in the Quran, in the chapter Surah Al-Ma'idah. Uh, we have created you men and women, people and tribes, so that you may know one another. Verily, the best among you is the most pious. So now you see the sense of equality, men and women peoples and tribes, irrespective. Uh, the same thing in, in, uh, in another verse um, in which the Quran said, and we have dignified the descendants of Adam. And, and we have dignified descendants of Adam. Didn't say the black or the white or the man or the woman. All of the descendants of Ben Ad, dignified. What does the word dignified mean? And the word karamna in Arabic is more than dignified. It's a combination of dignified and honored. What does it mean? Well, when you think about what it means, it means that it is the embodiment, that, that a human being is the embodiment of what the Prophet referred to as the 99 names of Allah. Al-Ghazali, of course, wrote significantly on it. I am presumptuous enough to want to change that and say 
you cannot name Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah doesn't have a name. So it's not proper to say Allah's name. It's, it's Allah's divine attributes. The attributes of, of what? Of mercy, of compassion, of, of love, of justice. The 99 attributes. And by the way, Allah's attributes in the Quran are more than 99. Uh, but anyway, this, the number 99 stuck because the Prophet said it in a hadith. It's sort of a magical uh, number. Uh? It's sort of a magical it's number. It's a magical number anyway. But I mean, there's a book by Al-Ghazali which is translated in English, which is a beautiful book to, to read on. And so now, you know, when you think of how did, did God honor, dignify human beings by bestowing upon human beings those divine attributes. A message which I have to say is not much different from the Judeo-Christian message of God having created humankind to the image of God. And, and of course people tend to confuse that by thinking the image of God is the physical image of God. It's not. It's, it's in, in bestowing upon human beings some of the divine characteristics, obviously not to the level of those of the divine. Well, I'm saying all of that to say that this Arab Muslim population of the time, as well as the other Muslims that join in, but because we are spoke, focusing today on the Arabs, let me focus on the Arabs. That Arab Muslim population must have felt pretty good at the time. If you came from Medina, or Mecca, or you were a Qureshi, um, you had to feel pretty good. Especially if you're, you know, second, third generation, and you can say, you know, my great-grandfather fought alongside the Prophet. Sense of pride. And look at how important pride is in the Arab culture. A sense of pride that remains with the accomplishments of the Muslim world, but the accomplishments of the Muslim world still with a very strong Arab influence. Not always the actual influence of Arabs as leaders, because Arabs were few in numbers, and frankly, the Arab civilization of the seventh century common era, the first century of Islam, was not really a civilization. It was not a civilization to compare with the Egyptian civilization, with the Mesopotamian, with the Assyro-Babylonian, with the Persian, with the Hindu civilization. These were Bedouin people, you know, that they would live the very primitive, simple life. They were in contact, however, with all of these culture and civilizations. They knew about it, they heard about it, they sat in front of the tents at night talking about it and, and saying, what did you hear on your last trip, whether you came from Habasha and you went all the way across uh, to Persia or to India, what strange animals that you saw, what people did you see, you know, what did they wear, what did they eat. So a little bit of these different civilizations transpired and prepared a society which we can honestly call a primitive society to be open and willing to accept the civilizational developments of other societies. And it was precisely that openness that gave an opportunity for Arabs to continue to be in a dominant position. But more importantly, for Arabs to open up Islam to non-Arabs. And so you suddenly see coming into Islam persons from these different civilizations with, with a great baggage of historic culture and learning and understanding and knowledge of science who embrace Islam, but in embracing Islam, they also embrace part of the Arab heritage. They have to embrace it if they're going to learn the Quran in Arabic. They have to embrace it if they learn the Sunnah in Arabic, if they learn interpretation 
if they learn ilm usul al fiqh to know how you're going to interpret the provisions of the Quran and the provisions of the Sunnah. But you also start going into the intricacies of how you do that. It was easy in the days of the Prophet. You had the Quran, and the Prophet interpreted the Quran. He was the one who knew best. Comes the period of Abu Bakr. It's still a very simple society, and Abu Bakr just follows what the Prophet did. Omar, the same thing. Ali, we start seeing a little difficulties. Uh, Osman first, and then and then Ali. The point is that by the time we see the big fitna with Muawiyah, um, and and we see the the Bani Umayyah system being established in Syria. And yet the Bani Umayyah system, notwithstanding the break that it produced in the Islamic world, was still able to generate a fairly significant civilization with its seat in Damascus. The opposition comes from where? The opposition comes from Baghdad. From the Abbasi, the descendants of an uncle of the Prophet. But the masses of their troops comes from the Mesopotamian basin. They're historically Assyrians and Babylonians and Mesopotamian. They come from also different cultures and different civilization. And they fight the Bani Umayyah. But the Bani Umayyah's rank soldiers, who are they? They're people from what we call today the Levant. They are their Syrians, they're, 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 they're what we call today Lebanese, um, who lived under the Byzantine Empire, who may have been Christians who converted to Islam, who also come with different civilizations. The point is you have an enormous mixture. You know, you have to think of, of a huge mix, mixer um, in which you throw in all of these ingredients and the prime ingredient um, are the basic tenets of Islam. But the other prime ingredient is the Arab culture. And you blend them together with a little bit of Mesopotamian, a little bit of Persian, a little bit of Zoroastrian in terms of religion, a little bit of Hinduism, uh, and so on. Hmm? But the central core remains what it is. We reach about the 10th century CE. 10th century, we are starting to see the effect of this enormous diversity. On the way, theology and law is interpreted. And this starts creating some concerns. The first concern comes from Ibn Taymiyyah. He said, you know, I mean, where are we going with this? There are just too many different ways of thinking. Through Persia, the Muslim world receives the Greek civilization. And it was because of that that the Muslim world, the Arabs, translate the Greek classics into Arabic. And that's what the Western civilization benefits from. But you know, you look at the different thinkings among the Greeks and, you know, the, the, the sophistry philosophical approach of thinking and the method of thinking is, is, is quite different from an Aristotelian approach. And so not only do you see a diversity coming in from the Greeks, but from the Persians, from the Hindus, and from other civilizations. Well, while this diversity is great in terms of helping to contribute to science and, and, and mathematics and others, it is very 
threatening to theology. Because suddenly you can have so many different interpretations. You can have such an enormous diversity. And between the 10th and the 12th century, you could see the diversity. And the diversity even affected the very classical schools of thought in both the Sunnah and the Shia. When you look at the four major Sunni schools of thought and the three major Shia schools of thought, and I will just give you one simple example in what is called Ilmu Usul al Fiqh, what are the sources of law? Everybody agrees the Quran is the source of law. Okay. But then you have to interpret the Quran, so how do you interpret it? What method do you use? Let's stop for a minute here. You say the Sunnah. Well, that's not as easily said as done. The Sunnah is debated. What is the Sunnah? Well, it's the sayings and the deeds of the Prophet. Well, what is the most recurring thing the Prophet used to say in Medina? Almost every day he would say that. He would say to the people, don't look and hear and listen to what I say. Listen to the word of God. His biggest fear was that people would be diverted from his revelations of the word of God to his everyday utterances. And he was the first during his 10 years in Medina to tell people, don't record what I'm saying. Think a little bit about the paradox. And suddenly everybody interpreted after he died everything he said and everything he did as being sunnah in the sense that it had a religious meaning. And I remember a debate on among scholars as to whether it was part of the sunnah to sleep on the right side uh, of yourself or on the left side of your you know when when you were when 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 you're were in your bed or you know whether it is on on your back um, and and you 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 come to a point where uh, when when uh, uh, the, the the hadith is recorded uh, by by, by uh, but by the two main recorders of, of the Hadith, you, you, you realize that they had to go through almost 200 to 220,000 purported Hadith. 200 to 220,000. What does it boil down to? In one to about 6,600, and in the other one to about 4,000. And the difference between the two is, is that Muslim considered that the 6600 had many repetitions and the repetitions came from the fact that the method that was chosen was to be able to link a hadith from one person to another. And so when you had a number of people who would come and tell you the hadith, they might have variations to it so the question was, was it the same hadith or was it another one? So now suddenly we have anywhere between 66 and 4,000 hadith. And the question is, how are you going to interpret the hadith? And you can't use the same rules of interpretation of the Quran. So the fiqh of interpretation of the Quran is different from the fiqh of the hadith. Because you can't have something called asbab al nuzul as part of the fiqh of, of the sunnah, you know? And the Prophet woke up one day, you know, and, and said something, you know, it has nothing to do with asbab al nuzul. But at that point, you also have a recurring undertone of the meaning of the word. And so the choice is, are you going to stick to the meaning of the word in its anthropomorphic sense, or are you going to look for its, its other meaning? Particularly at the time when the Shia are suddenly come up and saying, no, 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 we have to look at the hidden meaning. 
And the moment you accept the hidden meaning, then you say, well, who's going to say the hidden meaning? You know, is it, is it going to be the, 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 the provost of the East-West University, or is it going to be uh, Sheikh Talat Osman? Uh, and so it becomes a question of power struggle um, and, and of who is going to be able to identify the hidden meaning. And the Shia immediately recognize, boy, if we manage to control the hidden meaning, just as Ayatollah Khomeini discovered, if you accept the idea of vilayat al faqih you know, you've, you've got it made, you've got the power. Um, and so you can see this starting to, to enter. And suddenly you have now the emergence in theology of the grammarians, the students of the Arabic language. Well, but the Arabic language, let's stop and think about it. In the days of the Prophet, the Arabic language was a very primitive language. It was descendant of the West Syriac, which was descendant of the Aramaic. It didn't have vowels. It didn't have any of the diacritical signs, most of which were developed over 140 years later. And we wind up, after the Prophet's death, with seven qiraat of the Quran. So, in fact, one of the big debates was about one of the verses of the Qur'an which had to do with wudu. And it became one of the most controversial ones. In wudu, in the description of the wudu, it says you, you, you uh, sort of pass your hand on your head and then your feet. And then the question becomes, well, do you pass on your feet as you pass on your head or do you require the washing of the feet? And it turned on the use of, of Arabic grammar. And so many verses of the Quran turned on that. Um, and, and, and particularly with respect to issues involving women, um, they, they were very significant issues um, in terms of interpretation um, of, of certain words which had two meanings. Um, so suddenly the grammarians emerge and then you have all of these people who are coming up with different methods of interpretation, methods of approach. And I said, Quran, Sunnah. Okay, what follows? You have four Sunni schools, three Shia schools, all of them different. Is Ijma' the next one, or is Qiyas the next one? If you do Ijma' and then Qiyas, what do you go after? Is it Maslaha, Istihsan, Istislah? What are the other sources? Now, when you list 17 sources, you also have an issue of, of, of how these sources may compete with each other. So that if you have something in Qiyas that says something, and something in Maslaha that says something else, which of the two will have priority? So now you have to develop not only rules of interpretation, but rules that apply to conflict between rules. At which point you have a whole new science, the science of ikhtilaf, and the science of dissent, and different views and opinions and variants. How far do you go? How far is it permissible to go? So let me get back and tie it all up together. 12th century. What is happening? The Mughals are attacking. They have converted to Islam and the only thing they know about Islam is La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. They know nothing else. They descend in the same savagery, they descend on other villages. They destroy Muslim cities, uh, particularly as they descended on, on Baghdad and on other Iraqi cities, decimate many of the cities um, uh, built, including uh, substantial portions of Baghdad. Um, and in a sense, this becomes the dark age of Islam. 
And the only way the theologian thinks of saving Islam throughout this two century evolution, 10 to 12, is the return to the orthodoxy of Islam, the fundamentalism of Islam. The Ibn Taymiyyah, but in different versions and in different visions. And that means a strong adherence to the anthropomorphic technique of interpretation. The word, the word controls, the literal interpretation, the literal meaning. You don't go beyond that. That's the only thing that's going to keep Islam together. That is a very dark period for a civilization that had accomplished so much, that was so open, that was so tolerant of diversity, is suddenly now closing upon itself. And it's closing upon itself at a time when it's now being occupied for the first time by different societies like the Mughals and the Transcaucasus tribes. And that period of quasi-chaos remains for three centuries. And then in the 15th century, the Ottomans expand the empire. And the Ottomans bring to the rule a sense of unity, cohesion, and discipline. But they also bring the Ottoman technique, the Turkish technique, if you will, of government. Um, and, and part of it is, of course, a sense of discipline, but it, it, it also reflects the Turkish culture. And suddenly what you have is in an institutionalized way, the Turkish Ottoman were the rulers and the Arabs were the second class citizens. You see the, the, the contrast and that lasts from the 1500s till 1922. That's a long period of time. But for some particular reason, it, it lingers in the back of the Arab mind that one day they were part of a great nation, that one day they were a great people. In fact, you take the Egyptians. In a strange way, the Egyptians don't look back and say, we are part of the pharaohs. You know, we're part of the Islamic civilization, which, you know, is, is, is very interesting in terms of civilizational comparison. You know, it's like when you choose, you want to choose your heritage. Why would you choose the heritage of the Islamic civilization over that of the pharaonic civilization? Obviously, there's a qualitative judgment there. And there's a historic memory that, that one can think of is almost passed in a genetic way. The Arab, in a genetic way, transmits from generation to generation this great sense of pride of having been once part of a great civilization. But from the 1500 to 1922, they're second class citizens. They're dominated by another culture. 1922 comes. This is when you see the first emergence of the sense of Arabism. Arab nationalism emerges. Granted, it emerges with intellectuals from Syria, Lebanon, and from Egypt, intellectuals who have been educated mostly in France, who are bringing to the Arab Muslim culture. They're bringing in rationalism from the Age of Enlightenment. They're bringing in contemporary philosophers uh, uh, like, like Rousseau and Voltaire and Montesquieu, the idea of a social contract, of social justice, of, of new ideas that they believe in. And the Arab Revolution begins begins in 1919 in Egypt. It begins with revolutionary movements in, in, in Morocco, 
in the 1800s, in, in Algeria in the late 1800s, and in other parts of the Arab world. What happens in 22? The British occupy the Arab world. They substitute themselves. The dreams and hopes of the Arabs are now dashed again. They're now being occupied by somebody else. They're occupied by the Westerners whom they thought were going to bring them freedom. Hmm? They started rebelling and they continue to rebel. But the Westerners are smart. What they do is rather than stay, they co-opt from within each Arab society those who are willing to sell their principles in order to gain power. They create phony monarchies. They create phony dictatorships. They arm the military. And suddenly from within, we have these corrupt classes that become the rulers. And these corrupt classes that become the rulers, this is now not only injury. Injury is from the foreigner. But it's injury and insult when it comes from one of your own who oppresses you in the same way that the foreigner did. So the revolution started in 1922 or in the 20s or in, at the turn of the century when the Turkish Ottoman Empire started disintegrating. And it continues to build on. People don't understand that a revolution has one thing in common with nature. It's like a volcano. It erupts at different times. It erupts in different ways. It erupts with different force. And we have a different volcano in each Arab country. It has been erupting. It will continue to erupt. Nothing will stop it. In some cases, the eruptions are going to be strong. In some cases, they're going to be weak. The eruption of, of 25 January 2011 in Egypt was co-opted. Will there be another eruption? I'm certain there will be. I'm certain it will also not be the last one. There will be more. Because the history of revolution is an ongoing history like any volcano it has to reach its natural conclusion. And its natural conclusion has to be, and here I'm ending on a sort of a, of a note of one who, whose, whose belief as a Muslim is, is in an omnipotent God who has created the single humankind and who could not in the creation of a single humankind create multiple messages. There has to be one set of values that values are the values that I bring back to, and we have created you men and women, peoples and tribes, so that you may know one another. Verily, the best among you is the most pious. And we have created the descendants of Adam with dignity and honor. And that's what it's all about. The pursuit of equality, pursuit of justice, pursuit of freedom, pursuit of human dignity. And that's what the Arab people are pursuing. The problem in a nutshell, when you ask the question, what is America's policy or the rest of the world? My answer is, at the risk of sounding presumptuous, if you don't understand what I just said, you will never be able to have a policy that will respond to those needs and demands. 
If you don't understand how volcanoes erupt and why, you will not be able to stop them. You can have all the power you want. You cannot cover up a volcano. It will continue to erupt. Now, you can be smart enough to direct where the lava comes out of so as not to cause peripheral damage to the mountain. And, you know, if... Can you really? Yeah, I think you can. Um, maybe not in the geological sense of it, but I think that there are ways in which you can direct revolutions, and I'll give you a simple example. Um, and, and I lived through that, 1952, July 1952, Egyptian military coup takes place. Small group of officers, less than a thousand men go to Alexandria, surround the palace of the king. Who goes there? The American ambassador, Jefferson Caffrey, McCaffrey. And he goes there and he goes and talks to Colonel Nasser. He said, what are you going to do? Well, we haven't made up our mind. Well, listen, you've got to get the king go. Let him go with honor and dignity. And lo and behold, the Revolutionary Council agrees. The king abdicates. He leaves with 220 suitcases on his own boat, the Mahrusa, to go to Italy, accompanied by military officers. And I will never forget one instance that I found out later on from, from within. General Mohammed Naguib was there, and there was a, a colonel um, uh, who, who was there. He was a member of the military council, he was an Air Force colonel, and he had a stick under his arm like this. And General Naguib said, until this ship leaves the, the Egyptian waters, he is king. You put your stick down and you salute him. And he salute him. Huh? And this guy was Colonel, uh, what's his name? Akhu Salah Salim, Gamal Salim. He was Colonel Gamal Salim and, and he saluted him. And the king left. And the transition was done. Think for a minute. If we had somebody with enough intelligence and with the capability of doing it, would have told Mubarak two weeks earlier than he did to take a medical leave and to appoint the vice president who was not Omar Suleiman, who was dreaded, but somebody who was acceptable. Mubarak could have flown to London for medical treatment and he would have been considered as gracious maybe as, as King Farouk, but certainly the revolution would have accepted. You would have had a transition. You would not have had the Muslim Brotherhoods in power today. You would have had the secular forces remain in control with the support of the army in the background. By pushing the army in the forefront, you undermined ultimately the army you totally undermine the secularist movement, and you allow the, the, the Muslim Brotherhood to, to arise. And that's not going to be able, easy to undo. So yes, you can control the lava. You can control the flow of the revolution and, and make it move in a different direction. Um, so, but you know, I, I have no hope that the United States will ever be able to do so. It has never been able to do so in the past, and I don't see any reason why suddenly uh, it will change. Uh, this is not part of the American culture or the American political system. Uh, there will always be some force there, whether it's you know, this group in Congress or, or that group outside Congress or, or an APEC of sorts or whatnot that will always be able to um, have a veto power over something that would otherwise look perfectly logical and reasonable to, to happen. And so what do we have looking ahead of us? The continuation of the revolution that will develop in each and every country at a different pace. Different circumstances will affect it. And those countries in which the revolution has not yet hit a boiling point will reach it. 
do not think that Jordan is immune or Morocco is immune. Uh, it will happen. What will happen in each case will differ. We do not know to what extent, for example, um, the situation in Syria will degenerate. You already see the effort to turn the nationalistic situation in Syria into a sectarian conflict. Um, not only into a sectarian conflict, but into a geopolitical conflict with the, the, the role of Iran as part of it. And keep an eye on the Gulf. Don't you ever think that what happened in Bahrain was not the beginning of something greater that will happen in the Gulf with the sectarian conflict, Shia, Muslim, and behind it, Iran and, and other geopolitical interests. So, if I can use another analogy, the genie is out of the bottle. The revolution is ongoing. It will continue. Um, the struggle will go on. External factors will affect it. The stability of, of the economy of different countries. I see Egypt's economy collapsing, and this is going to be a very significant factor. What will happen, we don't know. There are objective factors in some societies which will be very outcome determinative. I mean, if you look at Egypt with 84 million people, in 20 years, it'll be 100 million people. Um, with 50% of the population under the age of 30. Within that age group that we now have, 60% unemployment. What will that mean when it becomes 100 million people? What will it mean when the 100 million people will be occupying more and more arable agricultural land? Already Egypt imports 40% of its food supplies. What will it import when it'll hit 100 million people? What will it hit when the arable agricultural land will go down and they will depend on the scarcity of crops coming out of new acquisition of land in the desert? What will happen when there will be a greater demand on the waters of the Nile in Egypt while at the same time countries like South Sudan and Ethiopia and others will demand a greater share of the Nile. And there'll be a struggle for water. How significant will the battle for water be, not only along the Nile River Basin, but the River Jordan Basin, among the Litani River Basin, look into the problem of water with Syria and Israel and Lebanon on the one side, Jordan and, and Israel on the other side. All of these are, are very real objective factors that nobody is looking at. Nobody in the Arab world is looking at. Nobody outside the Arab world is looking at. Nobody is making a projection on how these objective factors dealing with population, uh, dealing with, with the, the economy, dealing with water resources, dealing with change in, in the ecology is going to be. What do you think happened in Darfur a few years ago? What happened in Darfur was the result of desertification. Mm -hmm. huh? uh, the desert took over. And as a result, the people who were, were, were sheep herders and camel herders did not have uh, any land to go to. So they started encroaching upon the farmers. And you had a civil war. And we had an estimated 200,000 people maybe being killed, several million of refugees. Now, it took 10 years for this process of desertification to take place. Could it have been resolved? Yes. A 36-inch pipeline bringing water from the Nile to Darfur would have solved it. But at the expense of someone else? Not necessarily, um, because the Sudan is not using its water resources. Um, Egypt has 55%. I can't remember the percentage of the Sudan, but the Sudan is, is, is using about 5 to 6% less of the water that's allocated to it. So it, it, it could have been easily diverted without any problem. So anyway, so the, the, the bottom line is um, a Chinese proverb, 
that is supposed to be a curse and that says, may you live in interesting times. And we are living in interesting times in the Arab world and the interesting times will continue and I'm afraid it will turn out to be more of a curse uh, than, than anything else. Thank you. Well, the, the role of the U.S. in the Arab world, which was really an imperial role, any way you look at it, mm -hmm. um, has ended, uh, or is in its ending. It still exists with Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states. Um, the, the United States still plays a very important imperial role. Um, with, with the fifth fleet uh, based in Bahrain, with the biggest uh, uh, air force uh, base in, uh, in Qatar, uh, with, with a strong pre-positioning of uh, military equipment and the AWAC planes in Saudi Arabia, um, and with the support of the GCC uh, monarchies, this is the last bastion of American imperialism in the Arab world. It will last so long as these regimes last. And so Iran knows very well that it has to engage in a campaign of undermining these regimes. And it will do it through the Shia minority. Um, and, and in some cases, majority, as in the case of Bahrain. Um, but I think that there are other factors that will be at play. I don't know how much the Wahhabi Salafis are going to continue to support the monarchy. I think there will come a point by saying, you know what, we really have the power. Uh, and there's really no reason for it to continue to be in their hands. And you may see a sort of a new uh, uh, Abdul, Abdul Wahab emerge in, in Saudi Arabia and, and uh, uh, lead, lead the battle against, against the Saud monarchy. Um, so, that is likely to happen. I don't see the United States being able to do any more than just try to gain some time. And this time is, is I think, numbered in years and not in decades. Um, but, you know, the, the, the concern that I have 
is that the, the, the different revolutions in Arab countries are simply going to disintegrate into chaos. Um, Tunisia is, is holding its own because it's a small country with about five million people. Libya, one doesn't really know what the outcome is because it's still strongly divided in the three traditional tribal regions they had um, and they have enough resources to be able to survive no matter how. So Libya may not turn out to be a strong cohesive national unity but it, it could continue to, to, to sort of limp along uh, like that. But beyond that, it's difficult to see the viability of these other societies, particularly because of the demographic and economic factors that, that are going to undermine it. And when you go to these societies, there's really no planning for the future. There's no, even in Egypt, there's no economic plan. I mean, think for a minute that, that at the time, two years ago, January 25, Egypt had $39 billion in foreign currency reserves. Today it is estimated to have about 11 or 12, and of these, five or six are gold bullion and are not actually foreign currency reserves. There's also some rumors among those who know well that the additional five or six billions are really what is called uzunat uh, khazana, uh, which are papers authorizing the expenditure, but they're not actual money that's there. Um, and that the only reason that the pound has been held up is by selling the foreign currency reserves to hold on to, to the pound, an area that, that Talat is, of course, a, a master in. Uh, and, and now uh, you have all of these deposits by Qatar uh, very few of them are actual loans or grants, but they're deposits designed to shore up the Egyptian currency. But, I mean, if you think that at the present level, when Egypt has about 20 million people at or below the level of poverty, if the pound starts floating freely and you have an increase in the value of the dollar by 10%, in inflationary terms, it will be 20% double. And that means that you have your 20 million people are definitely going below the level of poverty and more are coming to it. What will that mean in terms of political stability in the country? Okay, I want to, uh, it's 8 o'clock, so if we could keep our questions short. Well, you know, I mean, I, I certainly don't presume to, to have a crystal ball to be able to look into the future. Um, you know, I, some, I, I like to project myself sometimes in, 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 in different situations. 
And the, the more I read about the Medina period, um, the one thing that strikes me, for example, is the number of people who in a 10-year period would call the prophet Muhammad. Think of what that means, you know, in a society in which here's a man who is definitely the leader of al Medina, definitely the commander-in-chief, definitely the prophet of a religion you've joined, and you call him Muhammad. Then gradually we're moving into Rasulullah. But the Sahaba mostly called him Muhammad. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? I mean, project yourself, you know, in a meeting where you're sitting instead of around the table, you know, in, in the house where Muhammad lived in Medina and where the first mosque was built, and you have a meeting uh, of the Sahaba and they're sitting around. Uh, you know, instead of on the table, on the floor, and discussing, and somebody is saying, you know, Ya yeah, Muhammad, I don't agree with you on this one. Democracy, equality, um, you know, this is, this is not a society, nor a prophet, who saw that Muhammad would be transformed into a semi-god. This is, this is not a society that saw Muhammad uh, as being anything more than the transmitter of the word of God, of being as perfect a human being as possible, but of having his shortcomings as well, um, and of recognizing the concept of shura, the concept of differences of opinion. How many times in Medina? Was the prophet opposed by the Sahaba? How many times did he change his mind? How many times did he even say something? And you had a verse of the Quran that came down and contradicted it. You know, I, this, this, is, this is when you think about it, this is a society that is, is built on what I would consider a profound sense of democracy in the sense of sharing in opinion making, decision making, but above all, in respect for your fellow human being, what's the problem today? The problem today is that you can't have two Arabs sit in the same room and agree on one thing, or three agree on two things. You know, three will come probably out with three opinions. And, and if a decision is made, will they all walk out and respect it? And will they all follow in line behind that decision? I will all say, you know, I didn't agree with it, but you know what? This is what we agreed upon. This is what we'll do. This is the biggest failing. And I think that this sense of individualism, exacerbated individualism, uh, selfishness, almost narcissistic in a psychological sense, um, is, is one of the biggest weaknesses that we have. You know, and, and we're vacillating between servility of people saying, you know, whatever the leaders say we will do, uh, and, and, and that total sense of divergence, you know, and we've lost the real sense that existed in the Medina days. It's a very good question. Um, I think you'll find that each society uh, has a different reaction to what I call the importance of accountability. Um, Libya. Um, you know, I chaired the UN Commission in Libya in 
recommended a number of people being prosecuted on both sides. Well, the Thuwars, who rebelled, says, well, we, you can't prosecute any of us, no matter what we did, because we were on the right side of history. We were fighting Qazafi. He was the bad guy. And it's almost like, the, you know, the end justifies the means. And at that time, the Thawars had between eight and 9,000 prisoners in their hands. And what happened now is instead of saying to them, hey, you can't hold these people prisoners, the, Th the Thawars are selling, ransoming the prisoners in order to make a living. So it's becoming their meal ticket. And, you know, think about it in terms of Islamic terms. I mean, this is horrible. You know, a Muslim selling another Muslim as ransom, um, you know, a Muslim going and killing another Muslim. You know, you go back to the gentleman who was sitting here, uh, the Prophet. I would strongly recommend you read the farewell speech of the Prophet, Khutbat al Wudah. The second sentence is the Prophet expressing his concern that the Muslim will be killing Muslim or attacking the Muslim and how the Muslim should be conscious of the dangers of the Muslim fighting the Muslim. Second sentence in Qutbat al wudah and how true it is. Now, at least since the end of World War II until today, think of the number of conflicts that have taken place in the Muslim world. Pakistan, Bangladesh. Whatever the numbers are, you know, I, the Bangladeshis are saying a million people, but as you say, you know, it's too many, whatever the number is. But we're still speaking of large numbers. Do you know that there hasn't been a single instance of accountability? Do you know that there are three times as many Palestinians killed by other Palestinians and Arabs than there are by Israelis? There isn't a single time that we have seen any type of accountability, whether it's what happened in, in Lebanon when, when, when the Lebanese attacked the Palestinians, or whether it's the Hafez al-Assad regime uh, attacking the people in Homs and Homa, or in, 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 in the Sudan, or in Darfur, or in Egypt, or in any of these conflicts. I mean, it is estimated that in less than a week, King Hussein and Jordan killed 15,000 Palestinians. What do you feel then about Saddam Hussein, who was supposedly judged and accounted, having to account, or whatever you want to call it? Saddam Hussein was basically executed. Yes. Uh, you know, everybody knew what Saddam Hussein did because Saddam Hussein made it a point to, to have the people knew what he was doing because this was a way in which he furthered his domination of the people. Yeah, it, it did him no good to hide, you know, the killings and the tortures. He wanted it to be public. He sometimes did execute people himself by shooting them in public because he wanted to create the terror-inspiring fight. So the people in Iraq knew what Saddam had done. Huh? And so the execution of Saddam was a logical conclusion of it, okay? But, but that is one, I just felt you said, you said that no one had been called to account, but Saddam Hussein seems to have been called to account. Yeah, but that's no, not really. Iraq, Iraq was an occupied country. Yes, he was, so that's what I'm really questioning. Yeah, yeah. Was he or was he not? I feel it was. Uh, he was. He was executed. There was no accountability, right. really, to speak of. Okay. And and the the the, the 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 perverse thing is that it is estimated that Saddam may have killed about three hundred thousand people during his thirty years, uh, and that in five years of American occupation, the same number of people were killed. Yes. You know, and it's very paradoxical. I was amazed. I mean, there were 45 prosecutions in Egypt 
including that of Hosni Mubarak. Not a single case was brought for anything done before the revolution. Not one. I mean, the Hosni Mubarak regime for 30 years would arrest and torture, in the estimates of people who follow these things, no less than 10, 15,000 Muslim brothers. No less than 10, 15,000 Muslim brothers. Every year were tortured. Think of, of the number over the number of years. I want us to bring us to our last question. It's getting past 8 o'clock. Very good question. You mentioned about the uh, Egyptian revolution. And you just made a point in saying that he was coerced. By who? He, he was what? Coerced. Who? The Egyptian revolution. This, this latest Egyptian revolution was coerced. Was actually was co-opted, co you mean? Co-opted. Co co-opted. In... Uh, well, you know what happened at the beginning? Uh, th this was a totally secular movement. Um, the, the Muslim Brotherhood stayed out of it. It wanted to see what was happening. Um, it wanted to see what the army was going to do, what the United States was going to do. Very cautious position. They didn't take the risks that the people of, you know, 25 March, 6 April did take. When they felt it was safe, they threw their weight into it. And they took advantage of it politically, because they're organized. They can put seven million people to vote from one day to another. Huh? And you know what? 80 years of oppression teaches you how to be disciplined. And you know, this is a group of people who have been oppressed, tortured, you know, killed, for 80 years. Uh, they learned at least the discipline of knowing how to get their people out to vote on elections. And they did. So I'm not saying that in a derogatory way. They played their cards politically in a very intelligent way. And they took over. They didn't confront the army. They didn't confront the secularists except in a few demonstrations in connection with the constitutional issue. Uh, they were able to avoid any major chaos. They were able to avoid the civil war. They used the political and democratic processes to their ability. They gained power. They're moving in a very gradualist way. You know, in, in, in a democratic sense, more power to them. They're, they're, they're doing the right thing by themselves. Now, whether that is the right thing for Egypt and for the Egyptian people, you know, is something for history to say. But at this point, there is no alternative in terms of an ideology in the country. And so this is the ideology that's being offered. And people are saying, you know what, give them a chance. See what they can do. Why not? Well, I want to thank Professor Bassouni for coming and joining us this evening. <laughs> Yes, um, we have an event coming up on February 5th. Dr. Martha Nesbaum will be speaking, so please join us then at RSVP. Um, special thanks to Professor Lisa for moderating, and thank you very much, Dr. Sharif Passioni, for that engaging conversation. I would not, now like to invite Dr. Lee Ritzover. I would like to present this to you for this great talk. And this is the longest but most delicious talk ever in American slave culture. Thank you.